fair question, why are used tractor prices so darn high? Are you gonna shorten axle life or your own life? Do you have to get a longer PTO shaft to reach? Am I gonna tweak or twist or damage my loader arms here if I'm using a snow pusher or a snow plow? Guys, how we doing? Welcome to GoodWorks Tractors. We've got another 10 random tractor questions for you today comprised of some of the most interesting questions that I've been asked over the last couple of months. Kind of jotted them down. Actually, I jotted down a whole bunch more than this, but selected the 10 most interesting and kind of all over the map. That way it maybe covers some questions that you have rolling around your head or maybe you're gonna ask at some point or couldn't find the answer to online. So thanks to you for the ideas here and hopefully this can help out some other folks as well. So if you enjoyed this video, consider giving me a thumbs up and also hit that subscribe button right down below. I'd encourage you to check out goodworkstractors.com where you can find a great array, a great assortment of attachments to fit your tractor, John Deere, Kubota, category one, category two. We can order things for you. Also obviously have a lot of things in stock as well. And always read through that description right underneath the video as well. You'll have a lot of helpful links down there to get to GoodWorks tractors or even other cool products. Some you can even get 5% off with code GWT. Let's get to it. Let's talk about ballast weight for your tractor. Had a question recently, also came up in a video not that long ago about just using a big old 55 gallon drum full of water. That's about the cheapest ballast weight you can get. Kind of hard to argue with that. I agree, it is very cheap to use. However, the best example I have out here is a, is a big drum right here, a sprayer, a tank sprayer. So when I have this filled on the back of my tractor, 1025R for example, and I'm driving around the yard or the field just spraying things out, when I go to make a turn, this way, that way, go up and down a hill, sideways on a hill a little bit. All that water, that liquid is jostling around from side to side and it can lead to some really uncomfortable experiences for the operator as they're just kind of being jarred back and forth. And also, if you are on any kind of a hill, it could definitely cause you to tip over you know, side to side or front to back. So I would encourage you to avoid using liquid for your ballast weight. If we're talking about liquid ballast inside a tire, yes, there's liquid filling this tire up right here, which is a great source of counterweight. The difference is the fact that in a tire, your, your tire dealer or your tire shop is going to fill liquid ballast above the rim. So up into this area here, which is going to take a lot of that sloshing effect out of here as you're driving forwards or backwards. The difference is going to be if you only fill your tire somewhere part way, say down here where it's not going to completely cover the rim, when you're going forward or going over bumps and hills and, and that type of terrain, this fluid is going to want to jostle back and forth here and it's going to have a big weight transfer as it does that and that's going to make for a very uncomfortable ride in the same manner that liquid ballast in a big tank or, or drum on the back would also jostle around. So on your three point, I would encourage you to get something like a ballast box. You can get suitcase weights that you can put on a weight bracket as well or even an attachment back here. So to avoid an uncomfortable operator experience or even avoid a potential safety hazard, use something solid like again a ballast box, suitcase weights or an attachment. I wanna take this moment to ask if you have more information, another answer, some other kind of solution to one of the questions that I'm talking about in this video, make sure you leave a comment down below as well. that help out everybody. Another question I was asked not too long ago was, what John Deere tractor in the compact world is offered with a gear drive transmission and also a mid-mount PTO to run something like a belly mower or even a front mount snowblower? So that actually stumped me for a long period of time trying to figure out I don't know, is there a model out there right now that actually does offer that? You may be able to get that current 3R series generation of tractors like the 3033R in a power reverser that also has a mid PTO. I haven't seen any of them, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. If you own one or you, you've seen one or you know about it, leave a comment down below. What I have right here though is a John Deere 3520, just a beautiful machine. This thing is 10 years old, so it's not currently produced. However, the 3520 is very similar to the 3R series of tractors made right now. This happens to be, again, a power reverser transmission transmission on here and lo and behold it has a mid PTO. Now I do think I've seen an older generation, I want to say it was a John Deere 790, maybe it's a 770. We're going 20 plus years back now, maybe even into the 90s. There could have been some tractors of that generation that had gear drives or power reversers, some sort of non-hydrostat transmission along with a mid PTO, but they're not very common. So if you're looking for that kind of setup, you may have to spend a lot of time searching around the country. So while it's not a plain Jane gear drive, it's about as close to it as you're gonna get anymore on the modern compacts. You've got your forward reverse lever here to change direction. You have your gears, one, two, three, four, your range, A, B, and C are high, medium, and low. Uh, you have a clutch down here and then a hand and a foot throttle as well. So it's as close as you're gonna get. And so if you grew up on a farm or you're just 
accustomed or comfortable with you know gear drives or manual transmissions or maybe you're just looking to get every ounce of power to the ground that you that you can possibly get then this is the kind of setup that you might want to look for I'll tell you this was a real gem 11 years old and only 80 hours on it it was one that's just a almost a once in a lifetime kind of find so I get asked a lot actually on how is the mower deck supposed to, to ride? You know, don't you just raise it up, adjust your gauge wheels to the position you want and lower it back down. And then as you're mowing your, your lawn, the mower deck is just kind of riding right on those gauge wheels and following along. Isn't that the correct way to go about it? Well, in the tractor world, with few exceptions, I think like the B2650 is one of those exceptions. All the others are gonna operate without touching the ground at all. So really the purpose of these gauge wheels here, or anti-scalp wheels, is to prevent scalping from happening. So if you are mowing along here and you're on an uneven piece of ground side to side, before the deck starts to just grind right down into the ground, these gauge wheels right here will hit first and prevent that from happening. Ideally, you wanna have those, and a lot of these decks are gonna have a little chart right on them too, to show you want about a 3 8 inch gap between the bottom of the gauge wheel and the ground. So what you will find on most of these tractors like this John Deere I'm sitting on is gonna be a separate control. You're gonna see a mower deck height adjustment knob right down below, or other tractors like the 3 Series tractor are gonna have almost a steel uh, bar with a bunch of little holes in it. It's actually your mower deck height adjustment bar. You would raise your mower deck as high as it can go and then pull out a pin and, and slide the bar in or out to make your mower deck height adjustment. It may have numbers on it. It may just have like a high, medium, and low. I found that when they have the numbers, they don't really correlate to an actual cutting height anyway. So it's best to kind of find the height that works for you and then take your tape measure out and see what you're actually cutting it at from the ground or get on a hard surface like a parking lot and kind of get underneath there with the parking brake set, the tractor off, all that kind of thing and measure from the ground to the tip of the cutting blade and see what that height is right there. Now a standard setup for raising and lowering your mower deck on a 1025R or a lot of older generation tractors is going to be with your rock shaft control, the same lever that's going to raise and lower your three-point hitch. This particular 1025R has something called an independent hydraulic deck lift, a pretty fancy option and not something you see all that much on smaller tractors. You start to get to the 2032 and 2038R, they're gonna have something called a command cut, which is an electronically controlled um, piece of circuitry over here with some independent hydraulics as well that you just push a little lever and it raises and lowers the mower deck independently of the three-point hitch. Another great question I'm asked a lot is, what happens if you put a quick hitch like this to make it a lot more convenient to attach to three-point attachments? What happens to the PTO shaft? Do you have to get a longer PTO shaft to reach. So what I'm talking about is right here, this little pin is gonna be the center line of where your three-point hitch would traditionally connect to your attachment. However, once we put the quick hitch on, it's gonna push that connection point back to right here. So overall, you're gonna go back, you know, about right there's a the center line, about four and a half inches further back, which means if you had a PTO shaft here, it would have to reach back or extend out four and a half more inches. Does that mean you have to get a new PTO shaft just to use a quick hitch? So I'm gonna tell you why I've never had a problem myself, and it's pretty uncommon to actually have to get a whole brand new PTO shaft just because you add on a quick hitch. If we take a look here, this is the sweep all. Really cool item, check out the videos. We're gonna have a two-part PTO shaft, very common setup here. Just watch, pull it off right there, okay? So this is one half of the PTO shaft. Here's your other half. The two sections slide over top or over uh, on top of one another. And as you can see, they're gonna have this much overlap right now. So even if you go out about four and a half inches, I left my tape back the other way, but that's a generous four and a half inches right there. You're still gonna have a good four, five, six inches of overlap. So. That's kind of the, the point of having a two-piece shaft is because, number one, as your three-point attachments go up and down, the length of the shaft that you need is going to change by a few inches. So you have to have some flexibility in there to begin with. The worst thing you can do is not cut your PTO shaft short enough so that it binds up. So having it a little bit shorter is not going to be a big deal as long as you still have three or four inches of overlap. So minus the rare exception, using a quick hitch on your three-point hitch is not going to require getting a new PTO shaft. One of the great questions I like to answer when folks ask me is, what is the point of these dualies, you know? And besides the obvious cool factor, they actually provide a, a big added amount of lateral stability, which is something that these smaller tractors just don't have a lot of to begin with. And unfortunately, a lot of the larger tractors that I'm asked about don't have kits available like this. And I know a lot of folks out there don't wanna run dualies. They, they see this and think, wow, you're gonna add a lot of additional stress to that rear axle. 
you know what, you're probably right, I can't argue with that. So for me, I've been running these dualies for the better part of a year. I took them off in the fall because you can't actually run a mower deck with these installed, which is one of the downsides, but I put them right back on after fall cleanup season was over. I haven't had any issues with them so far. I don't mind being your guy's guinea pig to see what happens. You know, there's not really anything clear or cut and dry in a warranty manual or any other type of information out there that's going to tell you how uh, much this is going to shorten the longevity of an axle or if it's going to avoid a warranty or anything along those lines. So what it comes down to me is, are you going to shorten axle life or your own life? I mean, one of those has to be a priority. If you can't be safe as an operator and navigate your property and get your projects done in a safe and efficient manner, then your tractor is pretty much useless to you. So. This is where that comes into play. It takes that side-to-side -side tippiness completely out of the equation. And if you ask me, it looks pretty cool as well. I do want to mention, if you feel like adding on this dual adapter kit, you can get that from Miller Tire. I've got a link down below in the description. You get 5% off with code GWT. Can you use a snowblower or maybe even a mower deck or another attachment from one John Deere series to another? Well, that answer is yes and no. So when you see a 54 inch snowblower like what this is right here, the actual snowblower, the yellow hunk of steel itself can be used from anything like an X700 garden tractor to a one series and even a, a generation one, two series tractor. However, after you see all the black pieces of steel up here, the PTO shaft, the quick hitch, the adapter bracket, even the short PTO shaft that's on the backside here, all of those items are gonna be custom sized and custom fit to match the individual series of tractor. This gets really tricky when you're shopping in the used market and it's one of those things I hate having conversations with customers about who have already spent the money thinking they got a great deal on a nice clean used piece of equipment. Oftentimes they'll have to spend hundreds if not thousands of dollars to make that good deal fit their tractor. It's going to end up being not a good deal at all. So you take a look at a mower deck, you have a 54 inch deck right here for a John Deere 2025R new generation. It is for sale if you're looking for it, I still have yet to get this up on my website. But this mower deck here is 54 inches. You look at a 54 inch deck for a John Deere 1025R and it's a totally different configuration. Mower decks are not gonna be compatible from one series of tractor to another by any stretch of the imagination. Not only is the mower deck configuration different itself, the attachment points are different, the hardware like what you see here and here is different. Everything is sized very specifically for these individual models which can be very frustrating and one of the biggest challenges when you're trying to shop in the used world. A great question that I've had several times and I like how you guys are thinking about safety is, do these tractors, do they have it standard on here, some sort of a, a rollover or a tip meter on there to sense when you're going too far and get back to, to safety? The answer is no, they don't, at least as far as I know. The weird thing is a lot of construction equipment does have that type of a feature on it. Even my golf course lawnmower has a tilt meter on it. It's a real great safety feature so you know when you're in that danger zone and when to get back to safety. So yes, this is my fairway mower that I use to mow my, my lawn at home. And you can see right here, it's got the, uh, the tilt meter that's on here. This is your safety point. You might be able to see the little ball that's down here and it'll go this way or that way, depending on the incline that you're on. I have seen these available on Amazon and other locations as well. If I can find where it's at, I'll put a link down below. It could be just a simple add-on to have at least a visual idea of when you are kind of getting close to the, to the limitations of your tractor or to the danger zone. Am I going to tweak or twist or damage my loader arms here if I'm using a snow pusher or a snow plow? Well, I think that's kind of a loaded question. I think any attachment you put on your front end loader, whether it's a snow pusher, it could be a bucket, it could be a grapple, a set of pallet forks, anything that's given the opportunity to load it unevenly on one side versus the other side could potentially twist or torque your loader arms and get them out of alignment. However, I do think that when John Deere or Kubota or anybody else is manufacturing, testing, designing, engineering their front end loaders and their tractor systems, they're taking some of that into consideration with the hydraulic system, the weight, the steel, the strength, the configuration of it all. It all comes together to make a very robust piece of equipment. So whether it's a bucket that comes right out of the factory, you could still catch a corner over here on one side or the other side and twist and heave and mangle the whole thing up. If you're going too fast and you're just ramming into a pile or you, you hit a stump that's buried underneath the, the surface of the earth that you just didn't notice was there, some serious damage could happen. Whether that's a bucket, a snow pusher, or even a grapple, the opportunity exists for you to do damage to your tractor. Common sense is gonna rule in this scenario. If I was going to pick a piece of equipment that could potentially 
be the most likely to cause damage or twist or torque those loader arms, I would probably say it's going to be a loader mounted snow plow. The reason being is that the plows are probably one of the widest pieces of equipment that you'll put on your front end loader. Think about it kind of like a breaker bar. You know, you use all that leverage, the length of the breaker bar to apply a force. It's the same thing with um, a snow plow, something like this. The further out you go from center, the more potential force or leverage you can get on there. So if you hit a curb or a, a buried piece of concrete or something else on one end and get that momentary reaction there, you could potentially do some serious damage. So I would say don't go too wide if you're going with a loader mounted plow. I still think that equipment is designed to use other attachments on the front end. That's why they give you quick attach options like the Skid Steer Quick Attach and the John Deere Quick Attach. That's my two cents on the situation. Great question submitted by somebody else who actually had contacted Westendorf after I didn't know the answer. So I wanted to share that information with you guys, but it's regarding the brush crusher. So you got the BC 4215, the BC 4200, actually even a BC 4255 right back there as well. This will apply to all of those, but it's related to using it on the new MSL, the mechanical self-leveling loaders that are offered by John Deere for the 1025 and the uh, 2025, the 20, all the two series, a lot of the different models. Basically, don't use one of these with an MSL loader. So it's not that it won't physically attach and connect and, and operate, it's just that the geometry and the physics of how the system works, as you raise up one of those loaders, the idea is that you can keep your, your load level. So if you have a bucket full of dirt and you want to, to not change angle as you lift up, the MSL will do that. If you have a set of pallet forks and as you're way down here and you want to raise up and keep those forks level, it just does that. It's a very cool system. The trade-off is, is that with the design of the brush crusher, the bottom jaw is essentially fixed and this top jaw closes down and applies force against the bottom jaw. So with the geometry of the MSL, as you're raising up, this top jaw is naturally going to start to apply more and more force against that bottom jaw as it raises. So you could get to a situation where you're applying way too much pressure against that bottom jaw and that is going to be the issue right there. You don't want to cause damage to the brush crusher and you don't want to apply too much pressure with your loader and cause damage to the hydraulic system either. So with any good system there are pros and cons, there's trade-offs with everything in life, that's the way it is. But if you have an MSL loader, don't fret, the brush crusher may not be for you but we've gone over a whole array of grapple options in a recent ultimate grapple guide video. So look for the other options that are available there. We'll have a solution for you either way. Great question, fair question. Why are used tractor prices so darn high? That's gonna be a multi-part answer there. Number one, demand is sky high right now. In fact, it somehow accelerated all throughout the course of 2020. You would've kinda of thought it would've been the opposite, but everybody and their brother was looking for tractors this year. You'll notice, and I had comments all the time, hey, where's your used tractor inventory at? You have almost nothing there. It's been the case the entire year and into 2021 so far. Very hard to find good deals that I can pass along on tractors. And you know what, prices just keep climbing. I, I had this uh, 1025 here, one of the first ones I've had in months and months for sale recently. It's been very hard to find. It's the most popular tractor on the market, at least in my opinion. But I'm paying more for tractors now just to get them, to get nice used, clean inventory, low hours, good features, all the good bells and whistles on there. But you know, after a certain amount of time, your perception has to change and, and prices do continuously go up over time as well. So what was a good price a year ago, it may never be a good price again. And that's the case with tractors as well. Compounding that though is the fact that new tractors, well, some inventory in the new side is nearly impossible to get or has a three or four month uh, lead time on it and new tractor prices continue to climb also. As an example of why prices are climbing, steel prices. I'm making a new product called a stump bucket or a front hoe bucket. The manufacturer, the fabricator I'm using to create that has had steel prices climb 30% in the last quarter of uh, 2020. So that combination of reasons there is why prices are going up. And if you don't buy now, I would expect them just to continue going up as well. You kind of got to get used to it and know that price is a moving target there. It's going to vary over time and I wouldn't squabble over a couple hundred bucks on a multi-thousand dollar piece of equipment here that's meant to last you a lifetime. Well, hopefully you found that enjoyable. Another round of 10 random tractor questions. As you guys keep submitting more, whether it's in YouTube comments and emails, phone calls, Facebook, all the above, I keep putting them together and we'll come out with another list of questions before too long. Don't forget, if you like what you see here, give me a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button to see more helpful videos and read through that description down below. There's gonna be all sorts of links down below. You can get to Goodworks tractors from there or even places you can get 5% off with code GWT. Thanks so much for stopping by. Until next time, stay safe. We'll see you soon.
You okay?